We're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 this morning as we continue in our series from the book of Philippians. I was remembering this week uh, that when I was a kid, maybe uh, seven or eight years old, I don't remember exactly how old, uh, one day my parents called me and my brothers uh, aside into the kitchen or living room. They said, listen, boys, we need, to, we need to tell you something. We need to warn you about something. They said, if anybody approaches you and tries to give you uh, one of those temporary rub-on tattoos with ink, uh, tell them no. Don't accept it from them. We're like, well, why? Well, because uh, this was the 1980s and there was a rumor uh, going around that there were uh, drug dealers who had placed illicit drugs inside kids' tattoos that were painted like Mickey Mouse or whatever. And so uh, I guess in order to kind of get, get into that elementary school market, uh, the drug dealers had done this. And so they were like, you could really get uh, hurt that way. Just say no. Now, now it turns out that uh, even though this was promoted like on the radio and at churches and schools, it was absolutely untrue, right? It never actually happened. But I didn't know that. And so uh, my seven or eight year old mind, when I heard this, I was terrified, right? I don't know if my parents ever even really knew how terrified of this I was. And I I had uh, visions, nightmares of people climbing into my window at night with sheets of temporary tattoos (laughs) and sticking them on me while I slept. All right, so, so I was afraid of this. So every night, and it felt like this went on for years, maybe it was just a couple of months, I don't know, but every night for a long time when I would say my prayers, it was something like this, dear God, please watch over my family. Thank you for my mom, my dad, my brothers. Thank you for Jesus. I pray that I would uh, be like Jesus and please keep the tattoo people away in Jesus' name, amen. And that was the end of my prayer. Like every single night, please keep the tattoo people away from me in Jesus' name, amen. And I prayed that for a long time until that fear went away. Now I share that uh, because, you know, in hindsight, I laugh at it, right? In, In hindsight, I laugh at that childhood fear. But then I began to think this week, how many of our prayers are really rooted in the same types of fears even as grownups, right? How often do our prayers boil down to, God, I am afraid of something and please keep me away from it, right? I am afraid of being in poor health. Keep me healthy. I'm afraid of my kids not being safe. Keep them safe. I'm afraid of going bankrupt. Please provide for me. Or maybe it's something instead that we want, God, I really want you to do this in my life. And so our our prayers tend to center a lot of the time on things that we don't want to happen and things that we do want to happen, right? And there's nothing wrong in and of itself with praying for God to provide, right? In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus urges us to pray that God would provide our daily bread, right? Meet our needs, But on the other hand, if we are not careful, our prayers can become self-absorbed so that everything we pray is simply, hey, God, ease my pathway through life. Take away all the struggles, take away all the pain, make everything the way I want it to be. And that becomes the essence of our prayers for ourselves and for other people. Right? But as we look at the scripture and as we look at the book of Philippians this morning, we're going to see a different type of prayer. It's not that we never pray for things that we hope for or dream about or want. But as we look at Philippians 1, 9 through 11, we're going to see a different type of prayer. I want you to think about this for a minute. As Paul was writing to the Philippian church, he only offers really one prayer For them, he has a limited amount of ink, a limited amount of parchment upon which to write, right? He didn't have stacks and stacks of notebook paper. So he has just these three verses to write his prayer. And what his prayer for them boils down to is not that they'll have plenty of money, not that they'll have an easy pathway through life, but instead this, that God will fill the church up with love. That's it. Paul says, if I can pray one thing for you, it is that you would be a people that are full of love so that as you grow in the love of God, right? As you become a people who are increasingly loving, you will also learn more and more what God wants from your life. 
And as a result, you will begin to reflect Jesus with your life, right? You will grow in love. You will understand the love that motivated God to give us Jesus in the first place. And that love through the power of the Spirit will fill you. And here's what's going to happen is you'll become a church that says, I want to love, I want to serve, I want to proclaim the good news. And Paul says, if I can pray for one thing for you, that's it, right? Not for an easy life, but for a life marked by the love of Jesus Christ. That's his prayer. And so for us, as we move into our semester and our year, and as we've started the book of Philippians, we've been saying what we want to do is we want to have lives that are, remember, poured out for the gospel. We want to have lives where we give our time, our energy, our resources, our talents, all toward the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ so the world can know who Jesus Christ is. If, as we do that then, Will you and I pray? Will we move our prayers more and more toward what Paul prays here for the church? Not that we'd be free of struggle and pain, but that as we walk through our lives, we would increasingly abound in the love of Jesus Christ. That's what we're gonna see. Let me read Philippians 1, 9 to 11. Paul says, in this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So Paul says this, he says, I pray that we, whoops, sorry, that's going to come in a minute. Hold on. That's very exciting, but okay. Pray that we will grow in love, right? Paul says, here's what I want to pray for you. Pray that we will grow in love. Now, now when I read this the first time, I thought that's an interesting concept. Pray that we will grow in love, right? Because our culture doesn't think of love necessarily as something that you grow in, right? Instead, love is like a force. It's something that takes you over. It's an emotion, so some of you, you'll remember that old song by the doors, hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name, right? And the idea is, man, I just saw you and I love you already, right? That's not biblical love as is described in Philippians. That's not what, we'd call, what we would call agape, right? Agape is the Greek word here that Paul uses for love. It's used all throughout the New Testament for love, right? Most of the time you see the word love, it's agape. It is not an emotion or a force that takes over you, but it's also not like a, a merely intellectual decision either. It's not like I just steal my will and say, I'm going to love. Instead, what love is from a biblical perspective, it's an attitude, right? Now, now, now I'll show Olaf here. Some of you saw the movie Frozen a number of years ago. And you remember there's a scene where they're talking about what is love? Right, and Olaf the snowman, he has this definition of love. Love is putting somebody else's needs above yours. Right now, when I first saw that movie, you know what I thought? Olaf's been reading Philippians. <laughs> right? This is a definition that actually comes straight out of Philippians chapter two. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, do what? Consider others as better than yourselves. That's the love that God has given us in Jesus Christ. So here's what Paul is saying, that love is an attitude where we say, the needs of others, I will place them above my own. And it's an attitude that reflects the love of Jesus Christ. Most powerfully in the gospel, John 3, 16, a passage probably almost everybody can recite. For God so what? He loved the world. He agaped the world. That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave his son so we could have life. That is the epitome of the love that Paul describes. And Paul says, my prayer is that you will grow in that love, that as you understand what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, do you understand the gospel? Are you rooted in the gospel? That Jesus Christ came and died for you and for me because we're sinners. And then he rose again, and all who trust in Jesus can have eternal life. Do you believe that? And are you rooted in the gospel so that you will grow in love? And here's what happens then when we grow in love. 1 John chapter 4, we love others, right? Because why? Because he first loved us. 
If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Right? In other words, Paul says, as your love grows, right? John is here going to say, look, as God loves us, we begin to love, right? And we love God, but we also love others, right? So the love of God fills us to an increasing degree. What Paul is getting at in Philippians chapter one is we're increasingly filled with the love of God. We understand it, we believe in it, and then we begin to express it. He says, I pray that your love will abound still more and more, it'll just keep growing, that you will increasingly be people who reflect this type of love. That's the growth of love. Paul says, I want you to grow in love. I was thinking this week about when our first child was born, our daughter. Somebody said to me uh, after she was born, uh, somebody said, didn't you just immediately have this deep and overpowering love for her? And, and I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought, well, I liked her. Like I had some real feelings of, of affection toward her. She was beautiful. Uh, she was my daughter. I did have a feeling of, of sort of paternal pride, but also paternal responsibility. But as the early weeks went on, uh, there were some other aspects to uh, her life that she brought to our life. For example, there were things that I was no longer able to do that I previously enjoyed, right? So uh, sleeping in, in the mornings, uh, being able to sit and read a book quietly, eating, right? Like I previously enjoyed eating meals and, and was unable to really for a while uh, very well, right? And, and so th- there, was, there was turmoil, uh, but as the years went on, here's, here's what happened, right? I began to know her and my love began to deepen and deepen and deepen, right? So she turned 14 this past week. Right? And man, there's a depth of love now that if I began to describe it would bring me to tears because because I did love her, right? I did love her when she was born. But the more I know her, the more I love her. The more I invest in her life, the more I love her. That's what Paul is saying. We begin to know God in deeper and deeper ways. And he says, I pray that your love will abound more and more so that you will be able to look back on the day you trusted Jesus Christ. And you say, yeah, I loved him then. And I was full of love then but I really had no idea the depths of love to which God's spirit could take me in Jesus Christ. He says, I pray your love will abound still more and more. And here's what he says, that there are gonna be some results then in your life of growing in love. Let me give you three results of growing in love. The first one is this, we will know Jesus better, right? As we grow in love, we will know Jesus better. He says, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. All right, there's two words here. One is real knowledge. This is a Greek word, epigenosis, all right, epigenosis. And it has this idea of not just I know facts about you, but I have an experiential relational type of knowledge of you, right? Epigenosis is is this, this relational experiential knowledge that comes from knowing somebody for a long time. I understand what they like. I understand what they dislike. I understand about their character and who they are. That's knowledge. The other word is discernment. Discernment is I begin to understand what your values are, right? I can tell the difference between things that you see as being just good and things that you view as being the very best, right? That's discernment. I can distinguish between good, better, and best. And Paul says, as you grow in love, that love is gonna grow paired with knowledge and discernment about who God is. Here's what he's saying. Uh, We often think, look, you know, knowing Jesus, it's not just some sort of mental exercise, right? You can really know the Bible and really be a jerk, right? Those two things can go together. But, but it's not devoid of knowledge either. Love is not devoid of knowledge. As love grows, our knowledge of God will also grow. The two go hand in hand. And he says, when you grow in love, you're gonna begin to know more and more about Jesus. And the more you know about Jesus, the more you're gonna love him, right? And so there will be this cycle between love and knowledge and love and knowledge ever increasing. It's a, it's a knowledge that isn't merely facts, 
but that is rooted in experience. So think about uh, when maybe it is your spouse's birthday or Valentine's Day or your anniversary, and you will profess your love to your spouse, right? Now, you might get a card, and in that card, you might write some things that you appreciate about your spouse, some facts, if you will, about your spouse that you know that cause you to appreciate them, right? But you, you don't do it sort of like a Wikipedia article, right? You don't write down like, Shannon Morton is known for her warm wit, prodigious talent, and dark hair, right? You don't, you don't just write it in sort of a detached kind of way. Instead, you write down, I love you because of how your humor and love and joy and kindness have impacted me, right? I know about those things, and I love you as a result. And the more I love you, the more I want to know. And the more I know, the more I will love. That's what Paul is saying, is that there is a cycle of growth and love. The more time we spend with Jesus to know his word, to worship him, to invest in prayer, the more we'll know about him, but the more we will know him. And Paul says, then you'll be able to discern what's important to God. So as you are making decisions for your life, you'll know what is good, what is better, and what is best. You'll have a deepening discernment of what matters to God and how God evaluates the world. So coming back for just a minute to my illustration earlier about about my daughter. My daughter loves to dance, right? She loves ballet and and dancing. Now, I grew up with two brothers. I never watched a ballet, much, much less participated in a ballet. When I was growing up, I knew nothing about it, right? But here's what's happened. Over the years, as she has participated, I, I kind of can tell a little bit better what a good dancer is, what a better dancer is, and what a really good professional ballerina looks like, and, and some of the differences in the way that they dance and the way the lines work, right? So, so like if, if Dusty Davis were to come up here this morning and do a ballet, not only could I tell you it's not great, I could tell you why it's not great, right? I could go into some detail. Now, I'm not a professional, but the more I have gotten to know a person, the more I've said, I want to know what is good, better, and best in your world. That's what Paul says, that your love will abound in real knowledge and all discernment. So you say, God, I want to know the values that you hold to, to know what is good speech and better speech and the best type of things I can say. What does it look like to love my family? Not only to love them well, but to love them as Jesus loves them, right? So I begin to discern between good, better, and best as I know Jesus better. He says, as you grow in love, you're gonna know Jesus better. Secondly, you're gonna begin to develop an eternal perspective. He says, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. Why? In order to be sincere and blameless, until the day of Christ. This word, until the day of Christ, really probably more has the idea of looking ahead toward the day of Christ. That is, I want to be sincere and blameless, increasingly doing what God wants and believing what God believes because there's a day of judgment coming. One day, my life will be evaluated and the things that I think and the things that I say and the things that I do will be evaluated before Jesus Christ. Right? And if we know Jesus Christ, if we've trusted in Jesus Christ, we have confidence that we will spend eternity with him. Right? So we're not going to be evaluated as Christians to determine, are you going to heaven or to hell? But instead, the scripture tells us for those who have spoken and thought and believed and obeyed Jesus as he has called us to do, there will be reward and praise at the, great, or at the throne of Jesus Christ, what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And nothing's going to matter to us more at that moment of evaluation than hearing Jesus say, well done. And Paul says, the more we grow in love, the more we grow in knowledge, the more we begin to develop an eternal perspective that I want to live for the praise of Jesus Christ, but I also want to live so that others around me can know Jesus and enter into his kingdom. We begin to realize what are the true evaluative criteria for our life. I've told you before, when I was in high school, I was in the band, I played the alto saxophone. And one of the things that I found interesting as I went through band was there was always a kid 
who would come in as you know a seventh or eighth grader and then move into high school. And there was always this kid that, that somehow managed to get himself like a $10,000 Selmer saxophone. It's a beautiful instrument, but he couldn't play, right? And then there'd be another kid with a $250 Yamaha that would just play circles around this kid and get first chair, right? And, and the kid with the $10,000 instrument sometimes was, was confused. My, I, I've got a better saxophone. It should sound better, right? Well, he has his evaluative criteria a little bit off, right? You are not evaluated for first chair based upon the expense of your instrument. There's only one thing that matters. It's how you play, right? I could buy $2,000 sneakers and I still will not come close to defeating Usain Bolt in a foot race, right? There's only one criteria of evaluation that matters in a foot race, right? Who crosses the line first? He could beat me in his socks. And the reality is that I think all too often as we walk through life, we get our evaluative criteria all messed up. When you stand before Jesus Christ, here's some things he will not ask you. What was your salary when you retired? What was the last salary you made? What was your title at the office? How many people worked for you? How good looking were you? How impressive were you? How many people knew your name? He'll never ask those questions. I believe the questions that we will hear. Did you love like I love? Did you seek to reflect the purity and the truthfulness and the kindness of God? Did you share the gospel? Were you faithful to follow me to the end? With your family, with your relationships, with your friends. Did you walk through trials and keep your faith in me? The deeper we grow in love, the better our evaluative grid gets and we develop an eternal perspective. We want to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Third result of growing in love is this. We will want to do what pleases God. The more we know God, the more we're full of love, the more our lives will begin to align. He says in verse 10, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. It's interesting, this having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, it's a passive participle, right? Passive meaning it's not something I actively do, but actually something that is done to me or happens to me. And here's the idea. The more I begin to love God, the more I begin to know God, the more connected I am with the Spirit of God, the more the Spirit of God begins to move in my heart and I listen to Him and He guides and directs and moves me toward righteousness, right? A lot of times, here's how we think about righteousness. We think, I just got to stop doing the things I shouldn't be doing. Stop being mean. Stop doing that thing, looking at that thing, saying that thing, those words that I know I ought to control. Be nice, be good, be helpful. And sometimes the more we try that, the more frustrating it becomes, right? Because we lack the power for righteousness. But here's what Paul says. He says, I pray that your love will abound still more and more. And as your love abounds, your knowledge of Jesus will abound. You'll develop an eternal perspective and the spirit will begin to move in your lives that you are full of the fruit of righteousness that through the church, we are reflecting the love and the goodness of God. I do what's right because I know the one who is perfectly right. I do what's right because I'm locked on Jesus. Galatians chapter 5, a passage again that many of you are familiar with, the fruit of of the Spirit. It's parallel to this passage, right? Paul talks here about the fruit of righteousness. Look at the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first one? Love, agape. And then what follows? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we are full of the love of God in Jesus Christ, 
we actually begin to reflect Jesus in what we say and do and believe. I don't know if you've ever met somebody who seemed to just radiate the kindness and the love and the righteousness of God. Where did it come from? From a lifetime of knowing God. From a lifetime of submitting to God. The more we know, the more we understand what pleases God and the more we want to give to God and others what pleases him. So this is uh, interesting. I was thinking this week about uh, how when Shannon and I first got married, we realized the very first uh, Christmas that we were married that our families had two different gift-giving philosophies. Um, the philosophy of my family is wh- whatever uh, you want, you write it down on a, like a piece of paper or you send it in an email and you say, I would like, right? I would like a Lowe's gift card. I would like some new clothes. I would like whatever. And then you send it to everybody and they go, that's great. You would like that. And they buy that thing, right? Like I would like one year, it's like, I would like a pet frog, right? So somebody gave me a pet frog. Now, now that was our philosophy. Shannon's family's philosophy was, um, you should know what we want right? And so it was, you should know. And so I remember the, the very first year, it was like, but, but how should I know? Like, how will I, how will I know? And see, the, the theory is, and this actually, it makes a lot of sense. The theory is that throughout the course of the year, if you have been listening and talking to that person, you will glean the types of things that they like, right? So maybe that person, you're driving down the road and they say, hey, did you see that frog? It was a beautiful frog. Right? And you go, you, you might ask a follow-up question, like, do you like frogs? Like, is frogs something that you, uh, yes, I love them. I would love to have a pet frog one day, right? And so you, you make a middle note, and it's like, it's July at this point, right? So it has to be, you probably have to make a literal, not a mental note, a literal note somewhere. Likes frogs, buy frog, right? And so <laughs> then you go, and at Christmas time, you open it up, and they go, there it is. You know me, right? You know what will please me because you've been listening to me. You see the difference in philosophy, right? And a lot of times I think we approach God more like with, with my family's philosophy. God, just, just, just tell me the stuff to do and I'll write down a list and I will check it off. But actually what the scripture says is it's, it's a lot more like the other philosophy. The more we know God, right? Because our lives are complex and our lives are not always able to be reduced to a list of stuff we should do. The more we know God, the more we know his word, the more we have a sense of this is what pleases him in this situation. This is what God wants from me. And so we begin to do what pleases God. All right, so that, that's what Paul prays for, that we will grow in love, that there will be this cascade of us growing in the love of God as demonstrated in Jesus Christ, to know him better, to have an eternal perspective, and to do what pleases God. So let me ask again as we close then, is that what our prayers reflect? When I pray, is that what I pray for, for myself, for my church family, for my spouse, for my kids, right? If I'm honest, many of my prayers are please fix the people who bother me, right? Please ease my path through life. Please give me X, Y, or Z. Instead of God, make me a person of love to respond to the world in love like Jesus Christ who loved us so much that he gave his life so we could have life. So a couple of thoughts then by way of application. One, will you and I commit to say, hey, I'm gonna pray daily this week that I will grow in the love of God and that our church will grow in the love of God. It doesn't take long to say, whenever I pray throughout my day, I'm gonna pray to grow in the love of God of God, that I will become a person who is rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, will I say, I, I want to seek to know God better this semester, remember, because love and knowledge grow hand in hand, 
And there, there are a hundred ways to do that. Let me just encourage you, uh, consider joining one of our home groups or small groups where you can connect with other people who are wanting to know and love God, to know his word, to say, I want to invest in the word of God. I want to invest in prayer. Because as we know him better, we will love him more deeply. And as we love him more deeply, we'll reflect him more faithfully. That's our goal. And that's our prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we are convicted that quite often we are self-absorbed. And yet as we read the book of Philippians, we see our self-absorption just being shattered, but being replaced with an absorption on Jesus, with a focus on Jesus. Father, we pray that we would grow in love. We pray that our love would abound more and more. The love that you demonstrated toward us in Jesus, I pray that we would return it to you and then reflect it toward others. God, we're so grateful for your love. And we pray, Father, that we would deepen in our knowledge of you this year and deepen in our obedience. We are grateful for this time, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.